Hundreds of migrants surged to the border in El Paso, Texas Thursday morning, breaching the concertina wire put in place by the Texas National Guard. Mexican photojournalist J. Omar Ornelas said hundreds of migrants were pushed south of the concertina wire in the middle of the night by Texas National Guard. Hours later, they again breached the concertina and made a rush for the border wall. According to Spectrum News, migrants were apprehended by U.S. Border Patrol agents and were then transported to the Central Processing Station. Customs and Border Protection says it would not be, quote, operationally feasible for Border Patrol to apprehend all the people there before they cross the border. As of 3 p.m. yesterday, all migrants from that group were removed from the scene. And this scene illustrates why immigration has risen to become one of the top issues for Americans in this year's presidential election. There's also been a tug of war between states like Texas, Arizona, and Oklahoma that want to implement laws and policies and the federal government, which creates national policy. Just this week, a major battle over Texas is law on immigration played out in the Supreme Court, but then an appellate court giving and then taking away power from state authorities. So when I saw that Supreme Court ruling initially and looked into it, it, it really does seem like there's a division between what the Texas National Guard wants and what Border Patrol is doing, which comes from the feds. And just this, this contention over it, it, it feels like there's more fighting within the country than there is you know, fighting for the country, fighting for what's best for the American people, fighting so that we have a reasonable immigration process to see, you know, you have this this appellate court essentially, you know, reversing what the Supreme Court had decided is very interesting as just a, a power struggle that can happen in, in the United States. We're, we're probably going to see the Supreme Court have to make another decision again soon. Yeah, and there's actually two uh, cases going through the courts related to Texas and its enforcement of immigration law. So the first is over that concertina wire, which we saw get overwhelmed in those videos. And uh, that's now, that's currently in a, it, well, it was in a lower court and there, uh, it went up to the Supreme Court, which determined that the feds basically have the authority to remove the razor wire if they don't want Texas to put it up because mostly immigration is uh, under the authority of the federal government as opposed to the states. Texas's argument was the federal government is not enforcing immigration law, so we have to do it to protect our own border. Um, but what's interesting there is that the Biden administration and Border Patrol have opted not to remove the razor wire and have allowed Texas to keep it up. They said that they basically had no interest in taking it down which is sort of a tacit admission that they support what Texas is doing um, and is going to allow them basically to take the heat for border enforcement when they're not doing it. And then the other case out of Texas that's going through the courts right now, which resulted in this legal jockeying, was the case uh, regarding Texas's new law criminalizing um, illegal immigration into Texas as opposed to just into the United States. They actually made it illegal to cross the border illegally into Texas as a state and also gave state immigration or gave state judges the uh, ability, the authority to remove people through the um, through deportation proceedings. Now, what happened there is fascinating. Um, so the lower court, the federal appeals court, um, said that they were going to put a stay on Texas's ability to enforce the law while they debated the merits of it and whether or not it's constitutional. Then the U.S. Supreme Court stepped in and said they were going to allow Texas to begin enforcement pending the lower court's decision on the constitutionality of the law. And then the lower court came back and scheduled a hearing as to whether or not Texas would be allowed to continue enforcement. And because they had scheduled that hearing, they basically grabbed back that authority to issue the stay from the Supreme Court. And then next month is when they'll actually have arguments on the constitutionality of the law. It's very messy, but I think uh, in, in total, these two cases coming out of Texas are going to clear up a lot of the back and forth over who actually has the authority to make immigration policy. And hopefully at the end of it, we have a clearer picture of where exactly the states can or should step in when it comes to a situation like the one we're having right now with the border crisis, or if it's solely the responsibility of the federal government and they basically get to decide uh, 100% what the immigration policy is going to be. It seems like a classic case scenario of the people on the ground being disconnected from those responsible for making policy. And, and making laws in the country and making decisions about what laws stand and fall, the Supreme Court in this case. Because you have Border Patrol 
in in the specific case that the Supreme Court ruled on that is now, you know, been handled by this appellate court, you have the Supreme Court saying, you know, Border Patrol wanted to go in and cross the border and because there were people drowning in the Rio Grande, a, a woman and two children caught on the razor wire. And there were there was another situation the same evening of, of people getting caught on the razor wire. And so you had Mexican officials communicating with Border Patrol, controlled by the federal government, about the situation. Border Patrol tried to go in and the National Guard said, said no, we're not going to have you go in. And the ruling fell on the side of the Border Patrol. And I think this really upset the people of Texas because they said, you know, we put up this razor wire so that migrants would go to the official processing facilities and the proper entrance points at the southern border. It was something to discourage them from trying to cross. Of course, it's a terribly sad reality that people crossing the southern border are, are fleeing conditions where they're willing to risk their lives to get to the United States, to get to a place where they can have a better life. doesn't matter who they are. Just hearing about people having to go through that is really sad. But it seems to me that Border Patrol wasn't saying Let's let's remove all of the razor wire fencing. Let's keep it as a deterrent. But if someone gets caught on it and they are drowning, we do want to be able to, to stop people from drowning. We don't want people dying on the southern border. We don't want Mexico very angry at the United States because there's a dispute over where in the border things like this happened. And so it seems to me that the, the National Guard and Border Patrol actually could have had a, a simpler compromise where it's you can't just remove any razor wire anywhere but you can help people if they're caught on the razor wire. That seems to me like it would have been the reasonable solution to this situation, but there was a lack of nuance in how it was handled by the law. Yeah, I do, I do know that case of the woman drowning. She was not, I, at least from what I read, not caught on the razor wire, but the claim was that the razor wire had prevented people from going into the river to rescue her. I'm not sure how true that is. That was um, that was what one of the state troopers claimed in Texas. But um, I also just want to quickly get to this other report about uh, Joe Biden's border policy and what it means, as you said, for more broadly, um, the conditions that migrants are finding themselves in. It looks like at least a thousand uh, illegal immigrants died trying to get across the border in 2022, which is four times the number in 2020 under the former president. And I think all of this devastation station, it, for me, only further furthers the point that we shouldn't encourage people to make this dangerous journey, give their money over to coyotes, um, allow their, their children to be sexually abused um, by making them think that they're going to get to stay in the United States so long as they get across the border. We've basically created the conditions for people to think that it's a good idea to make this dangerous journey. And most of these are economic migrants, so I definitely have sympathy for what they're going through. But the reality is that a lot of them are taking advantage of the asylum system when they're not uh, viable for asylum. They actually are, again, economic migrants. And so I think we can sympathize with the fact that a lot of people from around the world want to come to the United States for economic opportunity. That doesn't mean we have an obligation or a duty to allow everyone who wants to come into the country. And we also have to recognize that it creates a humanitarian crisis on the border when we incentivize that kind of behavior. And I'll toss it to you, Jess, for a quick response before we go. Yeah, just I'll say that, you know, coming over from Mexico, it's between 16 and 18 percent that are denied asylum that initially apply for it. I think what would help the process is an investment by the United States in processing a lot of people seeking to come here through online forms. Eighty percent of people living in Mexico have access to the Internet when people in the United States travel to other countries. You know, the visa process can happen largely online. There can be a coordinated effort from the Mexican government to confirm identities of these people and additionally on the border. It's going to require some diplomacy, but there are a lot of avenues that haven't been explored yet. And I would like to see our elected officials make policy that's more relevant to exactly what's happening on the ground there. More rising after this.